Good afternoon and welcome to the Block 4 First Monday. My name is John Horner and I'm here to welcome everybody on behalf of the Academic Events Committee. Before we begin, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Colorado College is located within the unceded territories of the Utes people. Other tribes who historically use and continue to use the land also include the Arapa, <coughs> Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. We ask that you honor the ancestors of those various peoples, nations, tribes, and families whose struggles for justice on this land inspire us. You may notice that, that this year we are doing things a little bit different for our first Monday. First, it is being held in the afternoon, beginning at 3.30, rather than the traditional 11 o'clock. This will continue throughout the year. Also, it is happening every other block, this year in two, four, and six, interspersed with a faculty research symposium in the same time frame on the first Monday of each block. Today's first Monday speaker is Serja Popovich, distinguished visiting instructor in political science on defending democracy through social movements. I'm honored to introduce Serja. I became aware of his work when my daughter Claire gave me his book, Blueprint for Revolution, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Men, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, or simply change the world for my birthday. Perhaps if the world had a similar sense of the sublime, it would be a better place. He's a political activist with a long stream of accomplishments from helping to topple Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic to establishing the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategy, AKA Canvas. These days, among his other exploits, he teaches a number, he teaches at a number of colleges and universities, CC among them. That is why we are fortunate to have him this block to talk about his work. And he even plays bass guitar. Needless to say, I'm a fan. Without further ado. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, marvelous introduction. Thank you all for coming in this uh, busy day. I see faces of some students from my previous block three. Thank you for coming. That means you didn't get sick and tired of a Serb. See some faces from the course that started today, which is named Defending Democracy. You owe me a comparison because we'll be doing this tomorrow in a class so where this is better or that is better. Uh, long story short, uh, uh, together with uh, some people in this room, namely the gentleman sitting over there, Slobo Ginovic, who co-teaches all of these things with me. Yeah, Slobo, thanks for coming. He's the most sick and tired of listening to me in the room, I bet. Uh, we, uh, we spent our lives trying to move people, figuring out what moves people, figuring out that once people are moved, they also need to be organized, and basically running around the globe working with activists. And in 2006, uh, then professor and now a very good friend from this university, John Gould, got to this idea that maybe students would be interested in how to mobilize people, brought us for an experiment, and almost 18 years after that, here we are, uh, teaching courses on movements and democracy defense. In my case, even more dramatic, I moved to live here. So rest assured, we'll be meeting each other even more. Uh, today's topics actually comes from a understanding that while working on democracy abroad and then moving to US, there was this growing demand of trying to figure out what is happening with democracy, how is democracy moving across the world, but most importantly, how to defend democracy at home. And this is where we start 
dealing with this class, I'm very grateful to Colorado College that allows us to teach this experiment. We'll see how it goes. Some of the people in this room will do evaluation, so we'll figure out where students like it or not. But basically, the idea that I'm going to be touching today is understanding this connection between the awaken population and democracy pillars. So how these two interact, and most of it will be focused on serious topics. What is the role of movements? How you defend democracy? Also how the other side thinks? Because unfortunately, as we see per all parameters, democracy is shrinking. It's shrinking internationally, it's shrinking pretty fast, the fastest pace since 80s, and it's shrinking from the top bottom. So these three findings were like, okay, we spend our life teaching people in Zimbabwe and Maldives and Burma how to fight against oppressive government, how to work against coup, how to deal with oppression. But what happens when you are in democracy? And you see this democracy is shrinking. So basically, we'll be looking into these things. Because this is scientific institutions, I'll call upon the science. We'll be looking into indexes, things like Freedom House, things like Legatum Institutes, Economist Intelligence Unit. These are the three best world measurements of level of human rights and democracy. All three of them are telling us that in the last 15 years, we have far more countries where democracy is shrinking comparing to the number of the country which are becoming more free. Seems that our enthusiasm about the third wave of democratization is faced with a harsh reality. More importantly, when you zoom in and look where it shrinks, it is not because the Islamic Republic of Iran is becoming more skilled. Actually, traditional autocracies are on their way to extinction. It is within electoral democracies where you have an electoral democrat that hijacks the institutions we love to call pillars from above and step by step runs the process which we internally call Erdoganization or in Europe, urbanization, where you have kind of electoral democracy, or at least you have elections, but you don't have democracy. And there are various names for it. Scholars name it competitive authoritarianism. Freedom House calls it hybrid regime. Orban loves to call it illiberal democracy. However you name it, it is the most common disease from which democracy is dying today. And unfortunately, it happens in a large and very important countries as well, places like India, which holds one billion people. So here we are on a breaking point. 2020 was the first year at the count since the downfall of Soviet Union, where majority of the world population was living in partly free and non-free countries. So we are getting to the point where most of the people don't live in democracy anymore. But in the same time, there seems to be an interesting antidote to this, and this is what today's talk is about. This is what part of our class is about. Uh, unlike indexes, we like to measure these things uh, in a kind of very militaristic way, and we are talking about the battlefields. And we have four main types of battlefields for democracy in this world, depending on the level of political space, depending on the level of legitimacy, of the government, bottom of the food chain is, of course, coup. Coup is when the group of soldiers grab power without elections. Then we go a little bit up, and we are looking into traditional autocracies. This is where power is kind of legitimate. There are people, actually two-thirds of people in Russia support Putin. There were people supporting Iranian regime, though this support shrinks. And then we move into a liberal democracy where you have kind of legitimate government elected on the elections, and you don't have such a harsh oppression. And then eventually you come to the place like US where you have external attempt to overthrow democracy. Whatever it is, it's very 
often connected with people who are mobilizing against it. You may be looking in the recent coup spring. In the last 10 years, we had 26 different coups or coup attempts, which is the largest scale since 50s or 60s. And you may see that it is the people power and nonviolent movements that are challenging or posing the most imminent threat to the junta regimes in places like Burma and Sudan. You may take a look at the Latin America and their authoritarian tendencies very often coped with the large mass movements of the people. What's really interesting is that these people are not protesting, they're not mobilizing, they're not building movements on ideological basis. We've seen large scale, mostly youth driven movements, sometimes ignited by non-political issues like burning the Amazon forests under the far right populism of Bolsonaro or far left populism of Evo Morales in the same time. So you cannot really connect these movements ideologically or religiously. It is more a movement that appears as a response to the oppressive governmental behavior. Sometimes, and very often, and I enjoyed stealing a phone from a student in my class as an explanation why corruption, bribery, and stealing is such a powerful mobilizer. In fact, the largest number of protests annually is happening about topics of cor corruption. Taking a look into how the corrupt government works, taking a look into different landscape and format, we'll see Israelis protesting in tens of thousands against Netanyahu before recent crisis. And these were not religiously or ideologically driven protests. These were protests against his attempt to seize judiciary, his attempt to clear himself of the criminal charges while being in power. Similarly, in Europe, Slobo just came from Georgia, where we, we are witnessing 85% of pro-European population facing the pro-Russian government who is trying to impose some kind of Russian political system over them, limit freedoms, and obviously, once again, you have well-organized movements. What connects all of these movements is that they are not led by mainstream politicians. In fact, it seems that mainstream opposition is pretty powerless and anemic when it comes to defending democracy. It seems that these aspiring autocrats know the game on how to divide the opposition, how to make them the part of the government. They are playing the political game very well. What they don't understand, what they don't know how to deal with is a large scale popular mass movements. With the rise of right wing nuts, there is no lack of these movements, mostly in Eastern Europe, where they were facing corruption in places like Romania or Bulgaria. Authoritarian tendencies of government and painting buildings in various colors, like in then Macedonia, now North Macedonia, where they are dealing with a growing illiberalism and anti-migrant policies, like in Hungary, or they are effectively mobilizing urban youth against the conservative government and achieving some important victories. After 10 years, the Kaczynski government was defeated on the elections 15 days ago in Poland, you will see outsized role of non-state, non-mainstream actors. And this is not one case, this is a kind of a pandemic. Not to mention here, at home, only since I moved or in the last five years, we are witnessing a large stakes of mobilization. Sometimes it's issue-based, sometimes it's a viral video based, where we are talking about the largest single day of political participation in this country, which happens on Donald Trump inauguration day. In numbers, it was bigger than Woodstock, where we are talking about a large scale, very horizontal movement against the systemic racism, which was triggered by a video of police people choking George Floyd 
whether we are looking at a more issue-based state mobilization things, especially the abortion issue after Roe versus Wade. Very often you witness unexpected results. People voting in large throngs, people mobilizing in unexpected places, people achieving very unexpected victories. Like every single ballot measure related to abortion issue was defeated, even in the deep red states like Kansas. This was not done through mainstream politics. Mainstream politicians may capitalize on it. That's a different thing. But when you take a look at how it has been done, it has been done through social movements. Recently, the guy with a very long tenure who ruled, overruled six American presidents by now, and a lot of Botox, Vladimir Putin, actually with invading Ukraine, which is the first singular case of autocracy invading democracy in the last 50 years or so, actually gave us the good excuse of thinking or rethinking the value of democracy. People do look at the war maps. They do look at specific weapons. They look at the war theater in Ukraine. But whether we will win this battle depends more on large scale international mobilization. It was the climate change and pro-democracy movement in Central Europe, most notifying Germany, that persuaded governments to divest from Russian oil. So we are not only looking at the people mobilizing at the place where democracy shrink. We are now looking at a kind of international reaction to assault of democracy. To understand this game, we need to refer back to my favorite manual or book, which is called Art of War, written some 3,000 years ago by a guy named Sun Tzu, the advisor of war on a court of Chinese emperor. This book teaches you a lot about the war, also a lot about the life. And one of the things that it teaches you is that you need to know yourself, to know your opponent, to know the terrain in order to know the outcome of the battle. So let's dive in into how those who want to strangle democracy think. We are living in the era of very different dictatorships. Back there in the times of Soviet Union or Ayatollah Khomeini's revolution in Iran, there was a substance, there was a backbone of authoritarianism, and it was very often ideology, less often, but pretty often religion. And based on the ideology or hardcore religion, there were a set of values that those who grabbed power tried to impose on a society. Unlike that, contemporary autocracies like Russia even some lovely junta setups, like the one in Burma where we work for years, they are very different animals. They are corporations. It is 400 people controlling more than a half of Russian assets. 400 people. We are talking about inequality in US, which is 1% against 99%. Out of 15 generals running junta in Burma, which we are pretty familiar with, 12 are multimillionaires. So it's not about the ideology anymore. It's grabbing from many in order to enrich very few. And this has been done through cutting freedoms. Also, they tend to learn. There is a great book of a guy we know called Will Dobson called Dictator's Learning Curve. They learn from each other. They borrow tricks from each other. But basically, the playbook is like in basketball. First thing you do is defense. So the first step in a playbook is make challenge at home impossible. The second step in playbook, if your fellow dictator is in trouble, help him. And I intentionally don't say help him or her. Historically, there were no female dictators that I'm aware of. Lastly, but not least important, keep your opponent busy, meddle with democracy. 
get under their skin. And this, with the expansion of social media and the way we consume news, has become the Hollywood for authoritarians. What Hollywood has done to the Soviet Union, Putin is doing to the rest of the world with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Surprisingly, companies owned by Americans. Really weird. But this is what it is. Now, on the domestic front, the first thing they learn is to prevent things. When you see a dictatorship like in Iran responding or tackling the freedom fighters with kinetic force, that means that they're losing. They don't want to get to the position where they need to contain uprising. They want to prevent uprising. So make sure that pro-democracy resistance is not funded. Cut the funds. Label everybody who gets money from a broad foreign agent. Russia, then Georgia. You want to see how these pieces of playbooks are invented in one place and then shared in another. Firewall country. So, you know, North Korea, build the wall, minefields. Now it's China's firewall. You want to learn about my name in China? It's inaccessible. You cannot, if you type my name in, Google, in, in search engine in China, you, can, you will get nothing. So preventing people to get the information, preventing people to get the inspiration, being one, head, one step ahead of the problem. And then, of course, media narratives, constant propaganda, multi-level channel propaganda, getting into situation where in some cases you want to get rid of the parts of your population because if you have oil, like in Iran and Russia, you don't care if middle-class educated urban people leave the country. You actually like them leaving the country because these are those who will make you troubles at home. Most importantly, make sure that you succumb, override, and control pillars of the system. In fact, judiciary. Make it incapable of making checks and balances. This is, once again, when you have assault on democracy in a place like Poland and Israel, and you see people on the street, they are complaining about the government trying to overtake the courts because if they do, there will be a metastasis of this one day when you can see a judge in Russia sending somebody 10 years of prison because of posing with an empty piece of paper, which supposedly means that that person is against the war. You need to control a judge to do this. This is not done willingly. Help fellow dictators. If Assad is in trouble, send him some weapons, or even better, send Wagner to help them. If Bashir regime in Sudan is in trouble, send the media consultants who will try to pin terrorist attacks on the opposition. If Russia is running out of drones, produce them in Iran. You see, unlike democracies, these guys cooperate closely and very effectively. Why? Because they understand the domino effect. Rarely in history has happened that the popular movement has toppled one government. Very often, if something happens in Ukraine, there will be a follow-up in Georgia. People will get ideas. So they understand that the vulnerability in one place may be the vulnerability at home tomorrow. Most importantly is disrupt your opponent. Authoritarians are actively disrupting whatever democracy they can reach. Sometimes it's just a moral support. Sometimes it's Marine Le Pen running the presidential campaign in France, funded by a loan from a Sberbank, state-owned bank in Russia. Sometimes it's really blunt. Sometimes it's more subtle. If you take a look at the accounts and production of anti-vaccine propaganda in US, you can tra trace it back to the Russia today. If you take a look at the 20 most prominent anti-vax account in the US, 
and analyzing people have done this in labs, the posts and repos they're using, and you trace them back to where they're generated. Why so? Because polarization makes democracies dysfunctional. The more you guys are looking at home and banging your head against the wall because you have politicians who can fire but cannot elect the president of house for like, what, four weeks? I'm just mentioning something that I read in the news a few weeks ago. The less you'll be looking how many kids can Putin abduct from Ukraine. This is like, you know, keeping you busy at home so you don't take a look at what we are doing. So after bad news, there are some good news. And the good news is that regardless of this authoritarian learning curve, the movements can win. And very often, more often than not, they are capable of winning. For this, they require three things. And when you talk in Colorado Springs, the city of largest number of churches per capita, you love this Trinity concept. So the holy trinity of success in nonviolent movements is you need to have a vision of unity, meaning you need to know where you want to be. You need to plan because there are only two types of revolutions in this world. They are either spontaneous or successful. Spontaneity in most of the cases will get you just killed. And of course, they need discipline, especially nonviolent discipline. So thinking about the unity and vision, you may trail back and understanding why values matter, why having a clear idea where a country is going measure. And why is your opponent so eager? to turn every elections into reality show until you eventually elect a reality star, but that's a different story. Why things like anti-Trump and anti-Brexit are not effective? Because anti-things are not effective. You need to offer the alternative, you need to offer the clear vision where you are fighting a battle for change in Oklahoma or in Venezuela. How you build this unity, however, why it is so important to understand that this means getting out of your blurb. There was not one single movement in history that has won without becoming mainstream. How you move from only your beliefs and being right into the space where you can align yourself with people you disagree with. Some of the most important battles in this country were won by understanding that sometimes in order to win, you need to forge a very strange cause. For those of you talking about the woman's rights, many may be shocked understanding that it was not just lefty liberal suffragette movement that gave women right to vote. It was when they aligned with the super conservative women who want the power to vote so they can stop their men drinking. And their ultimate goal ended up in prohibition. That was the coalition that granted women right to vote in the United States of America. Not really People like actually people with very different views. If you take a look at solidarity movement in Poland, you imagine shipyard workers, but it was the unlikely coalition of shipyard workers, urban intelligentsia, and Roman Catholic Church. Not really the people you can imagine in a bar around the table drinking beer. So in order to be successful, you need to mobilize the people who are not alike you. And that means a lot of listening, and that means cutting your horns and understanding that we need to find the smallest common denominator in order to win here. 
Understanding small victories, understanding power of tactics. It's not just protests and marches and masses that matter. It is how you frame these tactics, how you put them in a context. And some of them may be hilarious. You can make a toy protest in Russia. You can make Belarusian dictator Lukashenko arresting snowmen if you just color them the right color. It's red and white, which he can't stand. So a lot of these tactics are successful, not only because people are creative or brave, but because they were thinking what they want to do, what their opponent will do, and like in chess, thinking a few moves ahead. So when you come to planning, it's not just planning your strategy, it's also planning your tactics. And then very often the favorite topic of my friend Slobo, you need to plan for after the victory. Scientific research show that you have decent chances, actually a little bit less than 50%, to get your demands met if you operate nonviolent movement by book. However, you have less than 40% of chances to have that change alive and kicking after just five years. It is easier to win than to consolidate the victory. Most of movements don't fail faced with oppressive opponent. Most of movements fail because they are not capable to institutionalize the change. That may sound crazy. You know, mobilizing a million people is easier than changing the constitution, but actually it's true. Moreover, for this, you need to understand that this is a permanent process. And when we are going to face this, we are doing in a class, we start from the bottom of the food chain when it comes to democracy. We look at the coup first and autocracy then, and the liberal democracy then, and then the poor students will need to give me a recipe on how to save American democracy. The key to this recipe is to understand that, well, Ronald Reagan was not my favorite American president, but he had a great quote. Democracy is always only one generation far from extinction. The key of defending democracy in United States and likewise country lies in the understanding that it's not given for granted. It's kind of like love. You need to make it every day. Thank you for your attention. I promise I'll stick to half an hour so you can have time. <laughs> uh, we are um, uh, able to take questions if um, s someone would, would like to. Lady with a pink hat. Hi, hello, thank you for sharing. My name is Irina. I work in the Butler Center. I and I use they, them pronouns. Um, to frame this, so I'm not, I wasn't born in the United States. I was born in Togo, um, which is in West Africa. Uh, and we had our revolution from France in like 1965, and that's the year my mom was born. But I wanted to bring up the, the concept of like what is free. So like, France and Togo, we want a revolution, but we have a dictatorship because France still exists. Like the, the, the raw, is the, it's in the core, right? Like France takes 20% of our GDP, they keep our dictator in place, they send guns, they send money, they help to continue to kill our people. Um, France and Haiti, Haiti and the United States, the US and the Congo, um, the US um, and Israel, like the US standing continues to keep Palestinian people under um, threat. So like there is like real core rot. And I, the idea of even winning something, the idea of winning a revolution, I don't know when, when, when we win. <laughs> because even when women are allowed to vote, 
black women weren't, native women weren't. So like who gets to survive, who gets to die for the cause? And like the usefulness, what is the useful, usefulness of framing this under democracy alone? Because it feels like there's a step further, like there's like a core rot um, that I feel like needs to be addressed as well. Well, first of all, thank you for your questions. Uh, uh, second of all, uh, fortunately I had a pleasure and that's one of the advantages of my work with canvases, knowing these extraordinary people who tried change in crazy places. So I'm aware of the movement in Togo that happened a few years ago. I worked closely with Faridan Buena, who is now in exile. We also worked with people in DRC. And you are very right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, part of the problem is that you don't have history of democratic institutions in some places. And this is why building them or rebuilding them is so difficult. People come to us and say, oh, you know, you work with people from Egypt. And look at them now, they miserably failed. And yes, they did. The part of this was them setting their goal in ousting Mubarak, for which they were terribly successful. It was not even a revolution, it was a blitzkrieg, like replacing a guy in 11 days. But then everybody turned their back and say, oh, you know, they'll figure out democracy. How the heck will they figure out democracy? It's not one single operational democratic institution in Egypt for the last 50 years. They're mostly run by, you know, military captains and mayors, not even the military elite. Uh, what is really interesting, and that works in a lot of places in Global South, Africa in particular, uh, we need to think more about the models of democracy and abandon this very elitistic, privileged view coming from the West. I'm Serb myself, so I don't count myself into this, that, oh, you know, democracy is a copy-paste model which will somehow will prescribe from some Western countries and then kind of impose it on Togo or wherever we are going to impose it. On the other hand, there is no excuse for locals. Like, you know, we had wars, we had dictatorships, we had nationalism. Day 1999, we had NATO bombing. So we won against Milosevic being funded by U.S in a country which hates U.S. by their guts. It's doable. <laughs> so the thing is like, you, the, the, the change comes when people want to do the change, but this change needs to be indigenous. And yes, you can help this change internationally. Yes, you can target human rights violators and perpetrators internationally. Yes, and very useful. You can cut the funding and, and tentacles of their international business. Because even if you look at the, at the regular political elite in a dictatorship in Africa, they don't keep their funds in DRC. <laughs> They're having their mansions on, you know, Azurian coast and places like that. So that can be traceable. But it is the role of the people in every country to mobilize and organize and fight for democracy, and it is our role and duty to figure out how to help them. Our experience as the organization, and also few recent scientific searches, actually show that it's not sanctions, it's not funding, it's training that helps the most. So instead of trying to catch a fish of democracy and feed the people of the country with one fish, of democracy, what you would try to do is teach people how to fish. Um, you spoke about uh, access to the internet, um, specifically with China with a great firewall. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering your thoughts about um, access to the internet and whether um, there needs to be more regulations against maybe social media companies, for example as we've seen in Burma, for, uh, for example, with uh, um, ethnic, ethnic, ethnic violence against the Rohingya mm. and Facebook being used to proliferate misinformation. Mm. How should, I guess, I guess, regulations go about to allow for 
access to the internet, but make sure that that's not being used to further misinformation and violence against others? It's a tough question. We teach the whole course on campaigning in digital era. Well, the HAL block course in January. And that question pops up a lot. So first of all, like every scientific invention, let's say atomic energy can be used for heating up the hospitals, but it can be also used for nuclear warheads. And similarly, technology itself and internet itself, it's very difficult to say if it's good or bad. Like these things don't stick. This is not the typical God devil language <laughs> that you can use. <coughs> There are some good things that social media and access to internet uh, actually enable in the field of democracy struggle. Uh, first, it makes truth accessible. And even in Iran, majority of the people knows the government propaganda is bullshit because they have access to the real world. Uh, except for China, not one single country was able to effectively block this type of people getting informed. Or when they do, you do proxies and stuff like that. Second, internet made mobilizing and organizing faster, cheaper, and less risky. Uh, when Slobo and me were organizing rallies in, in Serbia, you need leaflets and door to door and radio commercials and graffiti and posters for people to hear that something is happening because the government was owning the TV. Now you make a Facebook group and this is what you do. It makes human rights violations very difficult to cover. You take a look at the, probably some of the least technologically savvy countries in the world. You see 10, 10 people protesting, 10 others are taping. And actually, the use of internet in the public mobilization is coming from unexpected places, uh, places like Burma or Belarus, places where internet has low penetration and is restricted historically. Most importantly, it enables horizontal learning. If something effective happens in one place, it is very likely to be replicated. If there is a mobilization trigger, like the video of three policemen choking George Floyd, it's very likely to spark large horizontal mobilization, which is very difficult to control. On the other hand, you are more than right. It's a censorship tool. It's a surveillance tool. It's a hacking tool. It's a trolling tool. And it's a spreading the misinformation tool. So it's like, like the atomic bomb. You can use, take a look at it one way or the other. Uh, it's very difficult for me. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not def, certainly not a techie guy. But in my opinion, it is kind of very responsible for the world to relate on three or four companies, which are controlling 60, 70% of the social media space just for them to decide what is a hate speech? I mean, do you trust Elon Musk when it comes to the definition of the hate speech? The guy is a troll himself. I mean, that's his character. This is who he is. It's not a judgment. It's a state of fact. <laughs> so taking a look into regulation probably it would be very difficult to regulate internet. I don't have an idea how that could be done. But some things certainly can be regulated. I mean, people were saying this for television, you know, 50 years ago. How to regulate the television? We need a free speech and free market. And then people start regulating commercials first and the you know, volume of commercials and the type of commercials. And now we get to this place where when I turn Netflix, I see if the content is appropriate for my nine-year-old. And this type of regulation, especially the abuse of this media, because the revolution that the new media brought to this world, there's this great enthusiast of new media, Clay Shirkin. It's a really cool book to read. It's called Here Comes Everybody. 
It's like he was looking into this kind of stuff and, you know, understanding that there were these two revolutions in the media world. And one was mass reach, starting with, you know, preventing church from controlling information by, you know, rescribing books to the Gutenberg machine, and then to the radio, and then to the television. It's like you reach many. And then the other one was, of course, telephone, so people can communicate. And it, the internet solved this because you have mass outreach and interaction at the same time. But that comes with a huge responsibility. And regulating this type of, uh, of the platforms will probably start with the understanding that it is one thing to have free access to the media. It is yet another thing that a large media company can harvest your information, micro-segment political campaign, and persuade majority of Brits to leave European Union, as Cambridge Analytica did. So like, even in the political advertising, you have some regulations. You cannot use black propaganda on TV. Somebody needs to endorse the commercial. There must be an organization which signs the commercial. So this anonymity slash freedom of speech thing needs to be regulated at least at place where we have troll farms in a country like Russia that goes against the political opponents. Because this has nothing to do with the free speech. I mean, this is a harassment 101, <laughs> if you want. So uh, I don't know how, but as a matter of fact, you know, it should be easy because at least for these four large platforms, which are super popular, actually four out of five TikTok is Chinese, they are here. So, I mean, it's, it's a job of democracies to figure out what to do with this. And these companies are responsible to democracy governments, kind of. I'm not saying put everything on a state server as Facebook did in Russia. Hi, uh, I kind of have another question on the digital side of things. Where do you see in, I guess, successful and failed resistance movements, the role of kind of operational security mm. against mass, really effective and efficient surveillance by states and other actors? Huh. That's an interesting question and it's difficult to answer in its short. But it's like, it goes back to the previous question. The reason, like the, where you put the social media and internet in a landscape of a struggle is important. And as long as you taking a look at it as a vehicle or megaphone or carrier of your message, it's okay. It is when it becomes a substance, when it's not okay. I had this, uh, amazing conversation with people leading Occupy Wall Street. And from my knowledge and work with Black Lives Matter, I've seen this thing on and on. Because the message and mobilization is spread through the social media, and because it becomes effective and very horizontal and very massive in a very short time, and especially because that type of spread actually increases ownership of the local branches. So unlike movements from 60s and 70s, or even mine and Slobo's movement, we had a clear leadership and decision-making process and some kind of discipline and the local branches. Uh, these leaderless movements tend to be very proud to be leaderless. They also tend to be very ineffective if they are leaderless. However, decentralized, movements need to be led because movement mean you're moving somewhere. Where are you moving? And uh, on the surveillance side of things, uh, historically, and I think we worked with movements from 50 different countries up to now, there is always this balance between what needs to be kept secret, really, and where the paranoia starts. <laughs> and uh, uh, what, in our experience, I haven't seen a research on that, 
there is a very small pro proportion of information within the movement that is actually vulnerable and tangible and problematic. Most importantly, and I'll give you the example from the real world, let's say you are not trying to escape surveillance of a well-equipped evil dictatorial government, but you want to cheat on your wife. 85%, and I think there is a similar, like in my experience, at least there is a similar relationship with the movements. Once again, I haven't seen the study. It's your own failure. So if you make a security culture and train people in how to avoid the detrimental effects of surveillance, then you don't care about the surveillance. So once again, I'll give you the example. Let's say you and me, we communicate through the tap telephone conversation. So we can talk about the protest that we are going to organize tomorrow in front of the Tat Library, where 15 of our friends, and we'll mention them by name in this conversation, will come in order to interrupt the session of the Board of the Trustees of Colorado College and dismantle this evil president or whoever we want to dismantle. Or we can say that we are going to meet at our usual time, at our usual breakfast place, in order to all together discuss how to make Colorado College a better place. Both conversations are tapped. One will produce useful information where your opponent can predict your move and act on it. Another one will be completely useless. So it's not whether your opponent is capable, like it's not where police is capable of opening your phone. It's whether you set the auto disappearing messages on signal. <laughs> because if you did, there is nothing in it. So once again, surveillance and technology matter, but your skills and security culture matter more. Most of the time, the reason why information is leaked from the movements we work, they're trivial. People brag about it in a bar, like seriously. So when you take a look at this, so building a culture, it's like I probably, for all of those of my students who were in a class this morning, so you're hearing this once again. Conditions, e.g., technology that can surveil you, matters, but skills matter more. Um. I had a question adding on to, previously you talked about how not every country can have the same cut and paste democracy. So in the US, as Colorado college students, what is our role? Where do you see our role in fighting for democracy here or mm. abroad? And like what impactfully on a personal level yeah, abroad is, abroad is easy. Come intern in Canvas, and then you'll be immediately involved in struggles abroad. Uh, here, or in any democracy which has well-developed institution, the key is participation. So the magic word is participation. No democratic institution, however established, will survive if people abandon it. That can be blunt, elections. Register to vote and participate in the elections. It can be a little bit more of it. Talk to Mila and figure out which city initiatives are pissing you off and make sure you appear in the session of the city council. It's not only having democratic institutions, it's about using democratic institutions. You're pissed off with something on college, write a complaint. Press the pillars to work. Because if they are pressed from above, they're not likely to be taken from below, they're not likely to be taken from above. And then there is this happy balance between institutional and uninstitutional, which we're bringing in two institutions in class. One is a movement, another one is Citizens Project from Colorado Springs. One is registering people to vote, moving them to keep their government accountable. Another one is BLM crazy guy who, you know, with a megaphone, who was leading protests in LA. 
Both are important. So the most important role for you as Colorado College student who wants to do something is to be aware that there will be nobody else to save democracy. It has to be you. And if you can make it a mantra and you can make it the organization, and if you take a look at the already existing organization at it's called Vote CC or CC Vote, something like that. I'm so proud that two of our former students were leading this organization. I was so happy walking in gym a few years ago when there was this nice commercial. You were not even probably freshmen at that, but some professors who use gym will probably remember it. Where we have this guy and he's so having a crush on this girl and he's getting his first date. And he appears on a date, and she asks him, have you registered to vote? And then here he is coming all the way back and explaining the process and getting to the box and signing the forms. And then, then he's late for the date, of course, because he needs to do all this kind of stuff. That was done, imagined, created, recorded by Colorado College students, aimed to Colorado College students. That's exactly what I'm telling. This, this is the answer, this is what you want to do. So it's not only about you, but you also motivate others to do this. Also thinking how, yes, you will probably vote in general elections next year, but your local voting power is sitting idle if you don't register to vote here while you are here. Because I'm certain that you will not vote on council elections from a Green L in Iowa, if you are from Green L in Iowa, you're not following this, but you can impact politics here. So one way to do it is thinking about how to boost participation and increase participation in existing institution, like elections, like uh, city happening things. Another one, if you care for the cause, grab a banner and go protests, like getting active. So there is no better time for you to be activist than now. There is a reason why students are always on the cutting edge of the social revolutions. They're passionate, they're young, and most importantly, they don't have anything to lose except for their crazy heads. No jobs, no families, and things of that kind. So. You know, enjoy it while it lasts. Thank you, Sergey. Oh, one more. Thank you for the amazing presentation, Sergey. I was just wondering what can we do about the normalization of plutocracies in the place of democracies, having a government be by the rich and for the rich people. And is it even possible for us to move away from this concept in this day and age of late stage capitalism? Mm. This is a very nice question and very important question. And understanding that tools for change are not useful only when applied to governments. And understanding that businesses are also structures that you can use this toolbox to change. In fact, understanding that businesses were a very important vehicle to achieve some rights in this country and a social change. I mean, I normally play this game. Say, how many of you have heard of Rosa Parks? Okay, everybody raises their hand. So why Montgomery and why buses? Why not New York and subway, whatever, planes? It is because the civil rights movement strategically understood that there is no way to change segregation laws going through the legislature in southern states. Then they walk back one step and say, okay, who is funding these politicians? Businesses. Then they use their leverage as the majority consumers of public transportation because in Alabama, white people had car, black people were driving in buses. 
then they impose the pain on businesses. And businesses are very interesting animals because unlike governments, unlike politicians, unlike dictatorships, they are rational. They operate on a profit-based thing. So if you want evil capitalism to change practice, you impose financial damage to them. And that works for any kind of business. So it is important, but you're not looking only in the government. If you have a skill to strategize and mobilize and organize, you're not powerless against the movement. And it's getting some traction now, but you know, it's like, like I read two news last week, which made me thinking about how it works. One welcome news was that the union that leads the car factory strike in GMC or whatever, got to some terms with the government. And that were a week of protesting and hundreds of thousands of people involved. And the Biden parading with a megaphone with workers, eventually they got 11% raise or something like that. And then the other news says Elon Musk outraged with what's happening in Sweden. I was like, oh, let's see what's happening in Sweden. <laughs> That's a country I like very much. So supposedly the workers in Tesla that were unhappy with some, well, they were prevent. Like he tried to impose prevention on unionizing in his factory in Tesla in Sweden, where 80% of labor force is unionized. So good luck with that. So what happens is that nobody distributes the parts. The shipyard workers doesn't want to unload containers with whatever is going to that factory. So you have the widespread solidarity of workers, which has nothing to do with car industry in Sweden. It will eventually cost him so much money that you will see a union in a factory in Sweden. So once again, you treat them the same way that you're treating the government. You're looking at the battlefield, you look at what you want to achieve, you create a unity around this issue coming from people from different walks of life, wider the unity, better the results, and then you use whatever tactic is appropriate. So it's like protests will not stop the car plant, but strike will. Yeah, one more question, I'm keeping you too long. a question to kind of dovetail on the other one about the United States and what's happening here. And it seems like there's been a lot of things to um, undermine our democracy in the last number of years. And I've heard um, someone say that to some degree, America might already be a semi-failed state in the sense that there are so many people in the population that believe the last general election was stolen. And that regardless what happens in the next general election, there's going to be a large body of the population that again thinks that it is stolen. And I'm curious your thoughts on that, what stop gaps, techniques, and that kind of thing. Well, it's a great question. On, on one hand, you have a relative success of a campaign that was persuading Americans that election are stolen. I don't really see that as a major threat to democracy. I see smaller participation in next election as a possible threat to democracy. Eight out of 10 times, uh, the illiberal Democrats, populists, the people who tend to hijack democracy, regardless of their left-right view, were elected on the elections where participation was historically low. And most of the times when you see a high level of participation, you have a good anticipated result if you're a democracy lover. So I'm less concerned with people believing into stop a steal type of thing, as well as I'm less concerned, well, kind of pre pretty concerned with people who think the 
vaccines hold chips or environmental change is a Chinese hoax or whatever. Whatever you can read in this type of, of content. I'm more concerned with people like us saying, oh, everybody is the same. I think the largest threat to democracy in 21st century is not the boost and loudness of those who want to hijack, but the silence and apathy of those who be defending it, if this makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you so much.